Okay, we're ready to start now. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, welcome to the begin Beginner Intermediate Guide to HTML5 and CSS3 in Drupal. Thank you for coming out. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure we pay the bills. <laughs> this presentation is brought to you by the good folks at Media Current. Um, if you're going to do Drupal, do Drupal right. Now that's out the way. So a little bit about me. I have a bachelor's degree in fine arts from SCAD. Um, I've been doing Drupal since 4.7, been in the web space about 12, 12 years or so. Um, and I'm currently a creative director at Media Current. And Kendall will tell you a little bit about herself. Um, oh, did you not put the mic on? I can, but I can yell. <laughs> I'm Kendall Cotton, I also work at Media Current. I'm one of the designers and themers. And uh, that's a picture of me and Dries. I don't know if you know who Dries is, but it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, um, no shame. No shame. I've been all. working in the media space, or in Drupal space, for about three years now. Um, started in Drupal 5 and worked my way up. And now I'm all the way at the top, Drupal 7, but I did just recently start another D5 project, so I'm enjoying that thoroughly. <laughs> Thank you, Kendall. Um, she didn't tell you, but she she is not she's the hardest working woman in Drupal these days. <laughs> I, I hear that. I hear all the buzz about it. Um, so here's some of the things that we're going to cover today. Semantic web in HTML5. That's very important. Um, real life um, applications and tactics you can use to implement HTML5 in your themes. Uh, micro formats and um, form API. A little bit enhanced UX design. You know, how, how HTML5 can help you design for mobile web. Um, a few, a f one, one major point, what to look for in Drupal 8. Um, and, you know, kind of our, our take on it, what, what, what's, what's going to be out there. And some tricks you can do in CSS. For, um, for all, you know, you print designers, anybody who's been in the print space, this may be, you know, music to your ears. So stay tuned. So what is HTML5? Well, it's kind of like this. I'm going to explain it like this. <laughs> this, is, this is the web, bad attitude, been the king of the jungle, I mean, just monster, beast. And this, this blonde haired girl here, that's, that's us. Well, you know, not me, but you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> this is us trying to figure it all out, asking for help. I'm like, oh, you know, help me. Browser support, you know, HTML5, you know. That, these are all the things that, that we're going through trying to battle this, this beast. We're not equipped for it. Here comes our, our, our protector. Big bad <laughs> HTML5. Now, it has the answer, everything we need. And we're going to show you just a 30 second clip to illustrate what we're talking about here. There it is. It won't be long. So you need to get a visual of what HTML is all about. Wow. Well, you know. Uh, yeah, that's YouTube for you. Guess you can't hear it. I can narrate for you. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't hurt me. <laughs> oh. And then HTML5 knocks, knocks us out of the way. But look, look, at, look at what he's doing to, to the web right now. It's just, <laughs> Owning it, <laughs> I own you. So basically, that's that's HTML5 in a nutshell. It's getting a little bit too gruesome, so we just <laughs> cut it off here. We don't, you know, in case there's any children in the audience <laughs> have any bad dreams tonight. Or anything, but, um, so uh, let me let me move through this. Come on, guy. All right. So how do we tame this beast? It's very easy. You can really make any site HTML5 by really is one, one simple thing. It's the dot type. If you change the dot type, it's technically it's an HTML5, but it's not, it may not be semantic, it may not have all the, the new cool um, you know, elements, but more or less, that's really, it's really that simple. Now, it's more powerful than this, but more or less, that, that, that's what it is in a nutshell. So this is the next, the next generation. Um, it's a better blend, basically. That's what HTML5, in a nutshell, it leverages um, HTML5, CSS3, and JS. And I say JS, I think jQuery and you know some of your more common libraries, jQuery libraries. 
So who cares? And they said, why, the question you should ask, well, why should I care about HTML5? Like, wh what is it going to do for me? I, I'm, I can tell you what I say, our peers or people in our, in our same space, all of these companies, Facebook, Google, WordPress, Microsoft, all of them have made statements in, within the last year about how they're, they're, they, they view HTML5. They're all committed to make that a top priority for their next operating systems, upgrades, what have you. WordPress is a beast. They're turning out these HTML5 themes daily. I mean, it's, you know, so it's a problem. And guess what? Drupal, you know, Drees, Granatic Drees, you know. My BFF. Yeah, yeah, her best friend. <laughs> See, no shame, no shame, no shame. Plug, plug. Um, you know, basically, this is, he believes that this is a top initiative for him. You know, I know you can read, so you can just read it. But the point is, he's trying to say that this is something that's on top of his mind, and, and Drupal 8, that's where you're going to see the implementation where you see a lot of the techniques and standards that we're, you know, we, 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 that we will be discussing, that's what we, um, he will be implementing this in the next version. So, that's why you want to make sure you're on board. You don't want to be in the cloud. You don't want to be anywhere close to the cloud. You want to start today, start making changes, doc type, uh, you know, you start using the new elements uh, section and the footer and the nav tags. And um, start thinking about the semantic web if you haven't already. You know, start start um, doing that today. And here, here are some of the highlights. You know, and I, I put them in bold here so you can kind of get a glimpse on what what are some of the new elements or important elements you should follow. They actually have now. Uh, you know, everyone uses ID footer. Everyone uses header and section. Well, now they have that as formal elements, and you you, you can, that you can reference. At this point, same thing. Oh, same thing. Um, just and, and moving on. These again. These are some of the new the Canvas API, which we'll talk about next session. But Canvas API, that's a big juggernaut. Um, and you have some form, key gen, output, and product. You have some major elements that are baked in. You know, it's that better blend that we that we were talking about earlier. The better blend and audio and support for video, you know, it's it's it's, it's exploded. It's a cool little graph we found. And guess what? You, you're gonna get you you'll be able to download this on Media Current website, slide share. You know, we give you all this. Um, you know, if if you check our site sometime later. If anybody are you following the Twitter stream? Um, we both tweeted the link to this, so you can actually grab the PDF right now if you want. Good, good point. Good point. Thank you, Kendall. So this is simple. This is a very uh, simple workflow you can follow to make to help you make decisions on what to use and you know when to use it and w where you are in the process. So far. So, with that said, Ken Lo is going to talk to you more about the semantic web. All right. So this is where we get to uh, the good stuff. And so uh, here, there we go. So you all know that anytime you you have a question, let's say you're having a debate, you're, you have some friends over for dinner, and you're talking about something, and you're like, no, it's like this, and they're like, no, it's like that. What do you do? You, you Google it, because everything's at your fingertips. But there's so much out there, you can't possibly, you know, like, you're not going to be able to just find the right answer right off the bat, or can you? Well, Google somehow, they figured out, right? They're like, we're going to get you the best information we possibly can for your question. You can type out, like, full semantic questions in Google now. And most of the time, like, do you, how, how often do you have to hit page two or three or four of Google? Like, you don't. Because most of the time, your stuff is at the top. Because they have done the work of bringing that stuff up to the top of the search results for you. But how did they do that? So this is where HTML5 comes into play. This is what we like to call semantic web. This is why Google can understand when you type out the full question, like, who would win in a fight, brown bear, black bear? Like, Who's it going to be? Google can figure it out, and they, they give you results, right? So semantic web is about taking information that's on the internet, and we're basically embedding some important keywords and tags and stuff within the content so that the search engines can figure out context. That's the important part. By making the web understandable to machines, this is, this is how all the websites can communicate with one another. This is how the search engines figure it out. Um, and you know, if, you, if you've ever been searching for, uh, well, like flights, you're trying to find the best flight from here to San Francisco. You know, they have to go out and they have to find all that data and they pull it together for you. So they're utilizing semantic web. So let's talk about structure. Like Dante mentioned, some of the newer elements out there. 
Uh, we've got header, nav, section, article, side, footer. You're all like, great, sounds good. I'm going to use it on my website tomorrow. I'm going to get to work. Well, let me tell you about what's the right way and the wrong way to use some of these new elements. Um, so there's actually a great site out there, um, HTML5 Doctor, you should check out. And this is where I pull a lot of these examples. So, you know, people get really excited about this. They want to start throwing it in their websites right away. And they're like, all right, we got header, we got H group, it looks really good, I'm going to start throwing it together. The wrong way to do it is, is as you see up here, uh, I've got my H1 tag, you know, it's the best blog post ever, and I'm going to wrap it in a header, because that makes sense. It's actually redundant. If you've got your, your H1 tag within an article tag, you don't need to wrap it in a header. You can, it's not wrong per se, but it's extraneous, you don't need it. Or down here, we've got H group, it's wrapped around the H1 tag, and then we've got the whole thing wrapped in header. Don't need it, forget it. Let's take a look at why you'd actually use those. So H group, you only need if you're wrapping multiple H tags. You've got a H1 for the main title, you've got a H2 or 3 for maybe a subtitle of your article, that's when you can use H group. And header is if you have supplementary information for your header. So you've got the author name or maybe the date, it's actually relevant to the article, throw that in the header. You've got more than one piece of data. Uh, section. What you don't want to do is use section for the sections of your site. It's actually for the sections of your article, for the piece of content itself. So, you know, a lot of times people start swapping these out for div tags. or just, you know, oh, this is my header section and this is, you know, the main content, my footer section. Forget it. This is what you want. You want it within the content. So, if you're, if you're looking at your blog post and you're talking about brown bears versus black bears. Maybe you open it up and then you, know, you move down into a section about brown bears and a section about black bears and a section about what would happen if they battled like we saw earlier in our YouTube clip sections. And they usually have you know, maybe an H2 that begins each section. So you want to title those sections too, very important. And, and I want to make a, a side note about sections. Um, admittedly, HTML, the doctor, the site that we pulled some of this content from, admitted to using sections wrong based on the, the spec because it's, it's, it's kind of changing. People are adapting it and using it kind of in different ways. But I just wanted to throw that point is that That's true. there's some confusion. There's some fluctuation. I yeah. mean, they're constantly reevaluating yes. the spec and saying, you know, we, we did decide that this was the best way to go, but after we got a lot of feedback, you know, maybe we're going we're gonna to change it up a little bit. So take everything with a grain of salt. You know, definitely check out that site because that's the most up to date. Uh, but we're just giving you some guidelines here. Um, this is an excellent tool, the HTML5 Outliner tool, which is going to help you see if you've already started implementing these, these new uh, HTML5 elements, you want to plug it into the HTML5 Outliner tool, and it's going to give you output like this. This is what the search engines see. This is what you know, the, the, the machines see. And it's going to break up your site into those sections, those articles, the headers that you've defined, and it's going to spit it out in an outline. So think back to like when you were in third grade and you were writing essays, you, your teacher made you write the outline first. Think about it that way. That's what you want your website to look like. And, and, and the funny thing is about, about this, how, how many people have spent late nights trying to get their site to validate? Am I the only one? Like, drive you crazy. The, the thing is, is that that's, that's important, but now this new era of web semantics is more important that the search engines understand what's the data you have on your site. It's, I mean, it's good to be, um, you know, valid, but that's the shift. That's one major shift you, you, you see is that it's more important to have it properly outlined than necessarily validated, per se. Even though Google will use that validation as a tool to rank, it's just that this is starting to become the, the, the more of a standard. That's cool. Um, a good tip, actually, about the body tag itself. Did you know you don't even need the body tag in HTML5 anymore? You can start rolling without it. It's not necessary. but. If you're old school, you want to keep it in there, you can actually use it as a wrapper. So you don't need to start throwing in. First thing you do, you start building your web page, you throw in that wrapper so you can get it to like 960 or you know, start giving it dimensions and stuff. Do that with the body tag. Throw on your drop shadow, throw on your borders or whatever, your background, and use it here. Uh, the nav elements. Um, this is specifically for your main navigation, and that might seem really self-explanatory, but uh, a lot of times people will use it in addition to the main nav to for their social links, they'll use it for how many times you see the big footers at the bottom. Um, they'll start wrapping all those little menus at the bottom in nav tags. You don't want to do that. You don't need to do that. It's just for your main navigation. Uh, semantic captions. So this is actually, this, this link here is a really cool trick if you want to add some flair to your site and your images. Um, but semantic captions, you only are going to use this specifically if uh, your image is what is considered a figure. Um, and a figure is 
it's sort of a self-contained unit. So let's say um, I've got an article and off to the side, I've got a figure that correlates to the article, but if I saw that figure all by itself with its caption, it would make sense. So it kind of stands alone, right? That's when you want to use a figure and a figure caption. You wrap the whole thing in a figure and you put the caption underneath the image. And you can also, oh, here's a code sample for you, you can also use one figure caption to describe multiple images. If they're all similar in context and the, the caption applies. All right, let's talk about microdata versus micro formats. What are they and why are they so small? So uh, ultimately, microdata, microformats, and also RDFA, these are all really similar, and they're just ways to define all these little pieces we've been talking about, pieces of data on your website, make them machine readable. And we're going to start with microdata. So microdata, and you're going to see this nice big list of definitions here, which all just kind of looks like you know, a sea of words, but these are, all, these are the little definitions that make sense to the computer. So the most important one is item scope because that defines what kind of piece of element we're talking about here. So like, if I'm talking about a concert that's coming up, that is an event type. Um, so that's the first thing I'm going to do is define what it is. And I'm basically pointing to, um, I think it's, it's a data vocabulary. That we're, there's, these have already been defined. You don't have to make it up. You just look at this data vocabulary, and I'm going to give you the link in a second, and you're going to say, this is, what, this is what I'm talking about, and point to that. All the rest of them, the item properties, the item type, the item ID, those are all kind of like subcategories within that type. So let's, let's look at the code. This make a little bit more sense. So all these, all these pieces in red here, these are the properties that we're defining. So up top, I said this is an event for Spinal Tap. Who else? <laughs> and uh, you're, I'm defining the URL of where, you know, where this page is we're talking about. I'm doing a summary, a photo, a description. Very important to start and end date. Um, you know, location, name, all that good stuff. So basically, instead of just being a wall of text that if you're a human, you can, you visually can break it up, right? You can see, well, this paragraph over here, I know, I mean, that, that's obviously the start of the concert at the time. I know where San Francisco is. Like, you, you've got all that stuff in your brain, but you have to spell it out to a computer. So you use these to, to wrap that data. And let's look forward to, to this in, in Drupal 8, um, even more, more enhanced than what's, what's now in Drupal 7. Right on. Um, there's actually some, some modules right now that they are building, and you can utilize with Drupal 7. Um, so this one right here, this is, I, I made uh, on my, my sandbox site a Red Hot Chili Peppers concert, because I'm not really into Spinal Tap so much. But um, down here you can see I've got an item property for my image. I didn't do that manually. The module actually defined that. So when I, when I go in and I build my content type, like I built a content type for events, that's where I define that item scope we talked about earlier. I said, this is an event, and, so it, and I pointed to the, the data vocabulary event. Everything else, all those CCK fields after the fact, I said this one's a date, this one's a location, this one's a description, and then Drupal will spit out the item property for me. So that makes your job a little bit easier, right? You don't have to remember all this stuff. You do it once, you fill out your CCK fields, done. Set it and forget it, you know, <laughs> famous line. Right. Um, I was going to try to show you. This is, uh, there's a tool that Google lets you use. Webmasters, yeah, which, rich snippets testing tool. So if you want to see how well this is validating, um, I tried it out with my Chili Peppers page. Let's see. There's my page. You paste it in here, and it will tell you. It'll go and it'll find if we get a connection. Yeah. So it found all the RDF labels, and it's pulling it out for me. And you can see it's got like the date in there. It's not work. I only just did this like a short time ago, so you want to be a little bit more proactive about how you're defining it. But it does work. Okay. So let's let's talk about microdata. Oh, we did. Just kidding. <laughs> Microformats. All right. Microformats, basically the brother to microdata. Um, this one, I, I tend to prefer. Um, it doesn't have a module built for it yet, that I know of at least. Um, but it does use the same kind of principle, but you're using um, classes to define your, your item properties. Instead of all the image scope, image property, you don't have to work with that. You can work with classes instead. So again, if we use a spinal tap example like we talked about earlier, we're describing an event, same thing. Um, but if I look at the code sample, you see that I have the span, I have the class in here. I've got street address, locality, region you know, date, start, and end time, but it's in a class, so what else can you do with that? You can rope in your CSS 
and you can start, you know, I want my date to float over here and I want my location to be really big across the top. So I feel like it kind of is, you know, two for one special. Yep. I, I personally prefer this method over, um, over the um, ladder. Right. But none, neither is really, you know, right versus wrong. Yeah. It's just personal preference. And, you know, once you start digging into the details, getting into the nitty gritty, there's a lot more to it, but we're just trying to give you an overview here. Um, another great way of utilizing this technology is uh, with an H card. And so this, think of this as like your business card for the web so that the internet knows who you are and it can define your information. Um, so I've got an example here I can show you like right on my, my own website. On my little about me page, um, down here you can see in the code I've got vCard defined and then I've got a class for my given name and my family name, which is my last name. I've got an organization, which is the name of my, my freelance business or whatever. So you can plug it right in there so that, again, search engines know who you are. And this is just a clip. Oh, go back. There it is. This, is. this is an example of all the kind of stuff that you can use, like HCard. Um, and there's actually a great tool that will build it for you. I like stuff that automates, automates the work. Go to the um, HCard creator or HCalendar creator, and if you're not into, if you don't want to pull in a whole module, let's say you're doing just your About Me page and you feel this is important, you can just jump on one of these sites, type in your info in the boxes, and it spits it out. All right, on to the good stuff. HTML5 themes for Drupal, of course. Um, so this is a great list here. The, all these themes are, of course, utilizing HTML. They're pulling in those elements we talked about. Um, I have to say that right off the bat, I was like, boom, adaptive theme. That's my favorite. I love it. It's got a whole lot of configuration settings, and um, it's, it's you know, HTML5 compliant. But I started looking at the list a little more closely to see, you know, give everything a fair shake. And I really like Omega. I took a deeper look at it. Omega has a ton of settings, just like adaptive theme is. I don't know if you guys are familiar with adaptive theme, but if you open up the theme configuration settings, you can easily turn on and off your breadcrumbs, um, redefine your search box, you can rearrange you know, your regions, and your, you, you've got a ton of configuration settings. So does Omega, but Omega also will let you pull in the Delta theme, and I'll talk about that in a second. And, and, and one, one point is if you're into panels, it's like kind of the anti-panel, but because the whole goal of Omega is so that you know everything is all well-defined. It's a great starter theme, it's a great, um, you know, theme to build the site on top of, so the whole goal is not to have to customize it that, that much. You can just start and go, and it has like, what, 35 regions or something like that, 25, something like that. And, and one of the big pluses I almost forgot to mention about Omega is it is one of those responsive themes. So um, let, me, let me show you, because this is worth giving a demo for. I think I got it pulled up here. This is uh, the Omega theme demo site. And responsive, meaning de depending on the size of your media, which is your browser or your cell phone, whatever, it will actually adapt itself. You see how the regions are jumping around? Mm -hmm. So the narrower I get, now it's showing it to me like it would if it was on a mobile phone, right? This does not do it automatically. I don't want to give you that impression, but it's built for this kind of thing. So when you pop in your media queries, it's, it's going to work better. It's, got, it's built with that in mind. And we'll talk about media queries um, later in the presentation. Right. Okay, so which one of these themes is better? Which one, you know, is right for you? It all depends on personal preference and, of course, which kind of site you're building. You know, how complex is it? You know, do you need all these theme configuration options or are you just, you know, building the basics here? So this is a really nice graph that will show you at a glance what kind of options all of these themes offer. And like Dante mentioned, you know, panels, does it work with panels? Does it have Drush support, which Omega does? Um, does it build in Skinner? If any of you are working with clients who really want to be hands-on with the CSS. Like maybe they know a little bit, and it's just enough to be dangerous, that's what we say. But they could use Skinner, which allows you to kind of add some CSS classes on the fly, stuff like that. Um, are they built on the 960 grid system, which you haven't heard of? I definitely recommend you look into that. Um, it's a great way to lay out your site. And you can, you can get this. We've got the links here on the bottom of our slide. Um, so the Delta module. I just, I just wanted to throw this in because I was wowed. I watched this on YouTube as I was driving down to Atlanta. The Delta module was built with Omega in mind, but now you can actually apply it to several different, um, I, think, I think they said all, but Drupal 7 themes. What this does is it basically, think about um, if you're theming your site, and usually your homepage looks a little bit different maybe, right? You want to add some extra regions, you got more stuff going on your homepage, so what do you do? You have to go create a template file for your homepage. 
throw in those regions and you know, get to work. Now I want to create another one for my blog page, and now I, I want to create another one for my news section. So I've got all these templates sitting around. If you have to go back and edit those templates, let's say you decide, oh, I forgot to add that region on the top of my blog page. I got to go put it on the blog page and the article page and go through all those templates. Forget it. Use Delta module and build your templates through the interface and let it do the work for you. And then you can apply those same templates um, on the fly, like based on either content type or based on your node URL. Um, and it has all these great configuration options. So what we're looking at here is actually the configuration options for the Delta, or I'm sorry, for the Omega theme. But the Delta, I wanted to show you really quick. Um, I don't know if I have time to do this. I'm in out of time. Kind of like Skinner for <laughs> themes. For it's kind of like Skinner for themes. It's, yeah. I won't go into it. It's going to take me too long to get into it. Um, but just check it out. Promise you. It's good. It's good stuff. Let me just make your life easier. Um, and JavaScript for your theme. We're going to touch on Modernizer in a little bit here. But these are all important JavaScript things that you can throw in to make any current theme that you have going on um, compatible with older browsers. So like the, uh, this is an IE ping fix. So of course, we all hate IE. You want to make your IEs you know, transparent. You want to use an HTML5 shim. How many of you know what the shim is all about? OK, a couple of you. All right. The shim is important because let's say we declare our doc type. We're rocking out some HTML5. We're using article, we're using header, we're using sec you know, all these elements, but what about the older browsers? How do they know what a header is? How do they know what a section is? The shim basically is a piece of JavaScript that interprets that and says, hey, just read this as a div, render it as a div, and read the CSS accordingly, and they basically make it so your pages don't fall apart, and so there's not unreadable elements. Um, Respond JavaScript is another great uh, piece to look at. Basically, depending on your media size, it will scale your images accordingly. Um, if any of you use image cache, that does it in a very fundamental way. You can define presets for your images. You know, I want this, this one is really small and view it on this page or whatever, but responsive does it on the fly. Dante's going to take it away with uh, modules. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, some, of, some of the more uh, important tools, I mean, you may be wondering, okay, this, is, this sounds great, um, but I'm, I'm really the type of person where I need to just get up and going really quick, right? Here's a list of modules that get, get you 80% mm, there, you know, 90%. Eh, so, you know, the HTML5 tools, that's, that's the more important one because that one will integrate with views. It will integrate with, um, you know, it will take care of that shim problem. You know, it will, it will add a lot of those details that uh, will help HTML5 render across the browsers. Um, we have an example of some other techniques you can do to help, you know, ease that um, HTML5 burden, development burden. But just, just a few highlights. In the video module, obviously HTML5 is really big with um, video now. And guess what? Adobe just announced that they, you know, they, they're waving the, the white flag. They, they have given up the battle for the whole, you know, like we're not going to support the, um, you know, iPod and, you know, we're not going to go, you know, support um, Apple, that type of thing. So now they're saying that they're actively developing um, to integrate with um, iPod, you know, Apple so, or, or HTML5 compliant. So that's, that's, that's really good news. You know, no more plugins. You know, they, everything's going to play nice together. And that's what you want. Um, you don't want to be that, you know, like that girl in the, <laughs> example, the beginning, um, again. Um, and, oh, this came up last night. It's kind of funny. The um, Aloha HTML5 editor, the WYSIWYG, you know, what you see is what you get. It's kind of never quite like that ever, you know, what you see is what you get. But if anybody's worked with it long enough. But, you know, you want your editors to have, this is in development. I don't want to promise you that, hey, you know, you can download this and, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. No, it won't work that way. But keep an eye on it because it looks very promising, you know, as in what you see is what you get editor moving forward. Um, you know, again, the same thing as video module. just takes, you know, thumbnails. You know, it does a wide range of things. It takes thumbnails of videos and you know, it helps you integrate your videos to your site um, you know, seamlessly, you know, you, like kind of like, like a, in a way, like Facebook, you know, you post it in, the link in there, and it kind of grabs things for you. Um, so this this module, this is what we focus on. It's it's like a Swiss Army knife. I mean, it's it's very useful. It has many different. It supports Google um, uh, 
um, frame, you know, um, a Google frame or Google Chrome frame, um, and we, we can talk about that later. Um, it, again, it adds the um, you know, HTML5 shiv. Uh, that, that's that JavaScript, piece of JavaScript that uh, helps IE and other non-compliant browsers recognize it. It creates, it, it makes the divs into entities. I mean, it makes the new uh, elements into entities in, uh, in, in, in uh, you know, IE. And it basically, it, it supports a ton of other form API markup changes, which you, which you will need. So you don't have to go and build that by hand and, and you know, mess around with that. Um, again, it, it, you know, it adds search integration, um, you know, user registration. It basically helps you transform your site, you know, past just, oh, I, all I have to do is just change the dot type. Remember I told you that earlier? Well, it just actually takes it the rest of the way. It's a good mute. Get across that mountain. Um, so and you know, simplified. So you know, you, you get the point. At, at, at this point, I mean, it's 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 a powerhouse. It's, it's a good tool to have. Um, and and you know, again, it integrates with views. That's very important. It gives you an option to output your view, you know, data as a as a um, HTML5 compliant, you know, structure. So it's, it's pretty good. Pretty How good many tool. of you guys have used uh, Views three already? couple. It's, it's basically like Dante's saying, when, when you're building the view, if you have the option now within the newest version of views where you can say, do I want to output it as a div or a span, which can be helpful when you're theming and stuff like that. So if you basically turn on HTML5 tools, now you can say, I want to output it as an article or a section or a header. Um, so it puts all those at your fingertips. Right, thank you. Um, anybody know him? I don't know him either, but what, what, he's, <laughs> what, what he says is very important because you say, well, Man, I have my whole base, you know, my whole website base is they, they use IE. And I really want to do some cool things, you know, IE 6 or 7 or 8. You know, they're, they're not on IE 9 and 10 on up. Um, so what do I do? Well, this is an option. You know. he, what, he, what he's going to say, well, we're not going to play the video because it's like two minutes, but he's basically going to tell you how easy Google has found a way to basically open up a screen, like you, you, you give your users, you point your users to this, this site if they don't have this plugin. It's basically a plugin. And what this plugin does is people who have this, this uh, plugin installed in their IE browsers, it will render your site like it was being rendered in Google Chrome. So you can, it, you know, be compliant. And it, it's, it's, it's seamless, you know? Yeah, woohoo. Yeah. Guess what? And this is how, this is one, there's two ways you can, you can let others know that, okay, my site works with Google iFrame. If you have an iFrame Google um, um, frame, then, you know, render my site in Google Frame. You could, you know, put a, you know, you could put a um, meta, metadata at, at the top, or you can do an Apache config. You can just drop this in your .hd access or put this in your Apache configuration file, and that's auto, you know, automatic. It's very, it's really smooth, it's really seamless, but the user is intrusive from one, one aspect because it's not completely seamless. Like, the user has to have it installed, or you have to tell them to install it. Like I said, it's just a one workaround. It's not the end-all, be-all, but it's just something that for, you can For the have. people that are stuck with IE7, yes. they can't update it because it's a company computer or whatever. Absolutely. This is a solution for them. It, that, exactly. This is what it, look, it looks like. No different, right? It looks just like IE. There's no, there's no, nothing indicating that this is being viewed in Chrome because it's really, an, it's an iframe, more or less, that, you know, you, it gets, your site gets rendered using all the cool HTML5 properties and, and, and innovation. So, with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Kendall to talk more about SVG. Got a little bit of mind-blowing action here for you. So uh, SVG, for those of you that don't know, scalable vector graphics. So what is the best thing about vector graphics? You can make them big, you can make them small. They never get grainy. They never get pixelated. You know, you got this beautiful picture of Boo, the world's cutest dog, and you blow it up, you know, fill up your whole site, and Boo's all pixelated. It makes you sad. So SVG is basically, th this is new technology. So. At this point, there's not a lot of integration with SVG on the web, I would say, um, but it's definitely getting there. And like we talked about, the quality, the compatibility, you can use it with all the current web technologies. And uh, I'm going to show you a demo here. 
so you can kind of see how amazing this is. So I first watched this video, and I was kind of blown away. Oh, there's the Google. Eye. I'll wait for it. There it is. OK, so this video, normally you watch, you watch your YouTube videos. You're used to seeing some of the pixelation. But this is just so incredibly crisp. I can even blow it up. It's still crisp. It's amazing. And this is on the site SVG Wow, where people just are putting these together to just kind of show off what you can do with SVG on the web. Wait a minute, you guys are going to be like, ooh, ah. Uh. I, I think they're internalizing <laughs> it. It's All just right. too much at one time. It's amazing. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> OK. So SVG, check it out. Um, we got some links for you. This is, there's another one. I don't want to skip it because it's, again, this is something a little bit more practical. If maybe you don't want to create an entire uh, SVG video for your website. You want to check out something a little bit. You want to say, well, maybe I'll just put it in my header. You guys see this going on up here? This is oh, all SVG. Oh, yeah. With HTML5 Canvas. Back up. That is a little bit of flair. Oh, yeah, I'm going to roll through all these. Adds a little flair to your website. And yeah, as I yeah. mouse over it, you can see it kind of interacting. Nice. And this is our favorite. It's kind of like, you know, the tag, the blink tag, the old HTML. <laughs> I, I don't want y'all to go crazy. Again, but, you know, use it with caution. Yes, use, use it, it responsibly. Caution, okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's see here. This is this is just for your reference after the fact. We got some good stuff here. We mentioned uh, dive into HTML5, HTML5 gallery. Um, I think we didn't put HTML5 doctor up there, but you guys can check that one out. And uh, let's talk about theming with CSS. OK. <laughs> you don't want to do this one? Oh, well, I was about to say, this <laughs> is Sparta. <laughs> uh, you got it. Anyway, the point here is that this is all about battle, um, this, um, the battle of the, the browsers. It's really not battle anymore. Now that IE6 and 7 and maybe 8 are kind of like out of the window, they're more, you know, it's, it's not as bad, but you still need some help sometimes. Um, pie. This is very, very important, um, um, you know, the tool to have in your in your box. It actually supports some of the, the more, I say advanced, but like you know, some of the, the default coolness of CSS3. You know, box shadow, rounded corners, multiple background images, linear, you know, gradient. Um, it supports, it handles a lot of that. Um, and one note about this, there is a module for Drupal that will actually just pull in the CSS3 libraries. It's not totally necessary. You could just go grab the JavaScript, plug it into your site, and work with it that way, but it just kind of helps you connect the dots. Yeah. You want it? Sure. Yeah. yeah, so this is, I mean, there's, there's basically, you're, when you're faced with any new technology and you're moving the web forward, you always have to think about, you know, those poor people that are left behind in the dust and making it a little backwards compatible for them. Um, but it's always good to keep an eye on statistics like this. So you can see how many people are really out there that are using these old browsers. You know, how many people are still sitting on IE6? And how much time do you want to spend catering to those folks? I'm not saying ignore them. You know, your site, your site should always degrade gracefully. <laughs> ignore them. <laughs> IE, look, IE apologize. I don't know if y'all know this, but IE apologized for IE6. Did Officially. you know that? Officially. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. I mean, sent out a web campaign and everything, advertising. They are sorry. They, they're telling people, do <laughs> not use it. They don't even support it on the upgrade page. They're like, we don't even know that we created it. It's like, you know, they're turning <laughs> back. I didn't do that. <laughs> it's politics. There's, so ignore IE6. I'm sorry. If it's not in banking, if it's not making you any money, get out of there. They're not going to make you any money. Yeah. IE7, I think, is not supported by Google anymore either. Yes. Yes. That, that was one of these announcements. They, yeah. They're saying, you know what, as of August 23rd or 7th or something, they will not support uh, mm -hmm. IE7 on their, all their platforms. And that's a big statement. You know, I don't know about you, but that's a big dog. I, you know, <laughs> go ahead, follow the leader. Right. And, and the other important consideration is, you know, you do want to make your site look pretty legitimate from, from browser to browser. You want people to have the similar experience. But do websites have to look exactly the same in every single browser? Oh. <laughs> well, we're supposed to ask the question. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's supposed to say, well, I don't know. Yeah, but the answer is no. It's flat out no. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. It should, 
be great. Yeah, you, you're going to have clients that are going to insist on it, you know, that they want it to be exactly identical. But you can, you can point them. There's actually, if you go to the URL, you can't really see it. It's called do websites need to look exactly the same in every browser dot com. And Absolutely. you just, you just send them that email yeah, yeah. and you're like, I just wanted to educate you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't want to get smart, but it's like, no, they really did make a website like this. I mean, <laughs> to, to your question, right. they didn't put this up overnight. Yeah, um, and this is, Modernizer um, is one of those modules right alongside with CSS3 Pi that will help bring those browsers up to speed. I mean, we can turn our back on them, but, you know, we don't want to leave them high and dry. I mean, even IE8, there's still issues, you know, so we got we to gotta help them out a little. So we're going to kind of rush through this a little bit because we're running out of time. But Modernizer, what it does is it adds all of these classes into the header of your browser. And so if you can see a couple of them, a couple of them have a no in front of them. So basically it looks at all of the stuff you're going to want to throw at them with CSS3 and HTML5. And if their browser supports it, it puts that class in there. If it doesn't, it puts a no in front of it. So you can theme accordingly. You can put in all those rounded corners with the browsers that support it. And it's a list of all the lovely features. And it's Zebra. Yeah. Oh, that, that's modern art. That's a pick. Oh, okay. Modern art. I'm sorry. I'm yes. over you here. But, you know, that's what it is. It's modernizer. So let's, let's jump right into the oh, media Oh, okay. Cruise. Media queries. You, you remember that as, as you know, earlier, that example where Omega theme, where it got smaller and then the tight side. Okay. Media queries is one way to achieve this, this type of uh, functionality. It's, it's like magic. You know, it's like, <laughs> like, you know, it's like not quite as powerful as Harry Potter's magic, but, you know, you get it. Um, these are all the media queries. I'm going to focus on screen, okay? And you can use all of these, but I'm going to give you an example of what we're talking about. You can have three different displays and all in one CSS file, right? Or you can break it up. Either way, you can do it in line. But you can say, hey, let me show you a good example. You can say, um, well, you know, I want, if it's uh, bigger, you know, if it's bigger than 70, include this, right? Or, you know, if it's below 70, you know, 700, include this. Or, you know, or, or, you know, have this set of theme, and you can tell the divs to do something different. You can exclude things. You can actually do an inline, um, you know, I'll show you another example, where you can do it inline. Like, you can use specific HTML elements. You can say, okay, I want this paragraph to be blue, or this paragraph to be red, depending on what. Um, you know, monitor resolution, uh, you know, depending on what the media is, we could change up the whole site. And it's really simple. I mean, it's not, it's, it, I say it's magic, but it's, you, you know, once you know what it is and it ceases to be amazing, you know, it's just what it is. But, it's a whole lot easier than designing a, a whole new theme yes. for your mobile browsers, you know. Yes, just, just, you just plug this in. And again, this is, we'll, this is all um, um, downloadable, so you can get these code samples. We want to give you a some time for questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of zoom through this. Keyframes, I don't know if you know, keyframes are basically, they're like, think of it as milestones, think of it as points where they're of segments and, you know, what they call, you, you know, to get from this point to this point, you animate it or you move it along a timeline to, to, to another keyframe. I don't know how much you, I don't know how many movie producers we have out there, but, you know, you get the point. And this is like kind of a diagram to show, you know, one end to the next, you know, 50 will be a key frame. All of them are like frames, but, you know, one key is like points, like segments and like ma major points in, in the process. And this is how you kind of move in CSS3, how you move things about. Um, this is a very basic, low level. Key. You know, you, you basically, you create um, your logic. You know, you create your logic down here, the keyframe, what you wanted to do, and then you call it up there on the div or whatever that you want, you want to have animated. Um, that's basically a... And the whole effect of what we're going through here is, is you're using CSS to animate your site. Yeah, exactly. It's no you flash. Forget flash. <laughs> I tell you, they're yeah. dead in the water, DOA. Dead on arrival. Um, so they're struggling to, to keep up right now. Um, fonts. Oh, so, so this is Kendall. Okay, so this is, this is one of the things we didn't want to go through this presentation without mentioning because you should totally be utilizing the import feature um, within your CSS. And if you don't know, Google has a fantastic font library that they're pretty consistently adding to. Um, it's spectacular. So, like, you can use all of these different fonts that you never thought. I mean, you thought you were limited to, like, Comic Sans and Times New Roman. No. You have this whole library at your fingertips, and you don't have to embed them on your website. You can just point to it, and it pulls the API. Uh, one word of caution, don't 
use 24 of these on your site because they will add to the load time. So pick one or two favorites and link tag. Yeah. Link tag. <laughs> moderation. Everything yeah. is good in moderation. So use the Google Font API. Use uh, Font Squirrel is another excellent one. That's if you have fonts you do, like, you know, I got to use this font. My client loves it. He loves it. So you can use Font Squirrel to create all the versions that you need to embed it on your website. And they do allow you to check the hinting box on or off, um, which hinting is all about how it renders, like, the letters, you know, basically with the pixels on your screen. If you turn on hinting, um, it, allows, it allows it to adjust the font so that it's easier for the human eye to read um, without getting to all the specifics on it, but it's a good thing. Font Squirrel, check it out. And, oh, mm. oh I rushed ahead. All right, we wanted, to, we wanted to surprise you. This is all about CSS3 backgrounds. <laughs> all, that, all those were done with CSS3, all, those back, all these backgrounds, purely CSS. So yeah. pretend I didn't just show you that. I'm going to give you another chance to ooh and ah, because we missed the video earlier. So OK, are you ready? You ready? Ooh. You're right. Ah. There's all, there's all these little speckles in the background. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah very good. CSS, well, CSS that's it. Three. <laughs> And this is the code sample, so you can believe me. I'm not making this up. Because, I mean, you would, you would write this in your sleep, right? It's yeah, easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right. For my print, I mean, how many in here are designers? Just raise your hand. How many? Uh, keep your hand raised. Keep your hand raised. How many are you print um, that came from print? So everybody that's designers also came from print. OK, this is for you. You remember in the day, you know, you could do columns. But, and then now on the web, you have to use floats to create these same type of effects. Well, now you can do the same thing in CSS3 with that column property. You, know, you can create a grid or, you know, just with using the, the, uh, the, the, this property. So you can flow text. And um, there are some other tools out there that you can do, you know, wraparounds. Now, this is not completely in CSS3. This is a tool that you can use. CSS text wrap that it uh, you know you go in there you use this tool and then it'll produce the CSS and HTML you need to produce that kind of effect around your picture. And it's a cheat, but you know if, you, if you're looking to do something swanky, you know, it's, it's one way to get there. Um, again, we want to leave some time. These are all the links that we have. You know that some of the examples, and we want to sincerely thank you for your time. Anybody with any questions? Got we a few candy. minutes. The, the links. And we had candy, but we didn't know it was going to be in the auditorium. We were going to ask questions. <laughs> we can still throw it. We can throw it. I don't <laughs> want anybody. Go ahead. Oh, you, oh, piece of candy. You didn't have a question for me. You just want a piece of candy. You want Skittles or Snickers? <laughs> huh? <gasps> uh, yes. OK, good. good. You want a Snickers for that? That was a good. <laughs> You don't want to put up copyright fonts, uh, especially especially the big ones. You want to be really careful about that. But there's a lot of font designers out there that are posting, you know, free for use, and yeah. some of them will say free for personal use. So you always want to check, check the fine print, but it's, it'll allow you. To know it's like music, you know, you're still stealing, even though you, <laughs> somebody made it easy. You're still stealing. You don't want to download your yeah, you don't want to. Yeah, it's still. Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's, I can check it out for you, and I have your card. I can get back to you. Um, anybody else? Uh, we got it at the first slide. Here. We had it in the first slide. Either one of our tweet handles. Back, back in in the back with the turquoise the green vest. Oh, oh, you don't have a question? That's the shortened link at the bottom there. And if you follow either of us on Twitter, we we tweeted it, so you don't have to type that out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that uses a yeah. custom font. That's the same thing. Oh, um, the question is on the Drupal Camp Atlanta site, is that a, at font face? And the answer is? Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right, yeah, that's all selectable text. And yes, that's all selectable text. I, was, I think it was actually in the Google font API. You're over there. I didn't hear you. 
I think we had that in the list it of. Could have um, been in the sea of links if, yeah. if it wasn't uh, HTML5 test. <laughs> yeah. Let it be known. Yeah. I, Oh, okay. that'd be a good resource. Yes, it's on camera. Now everybody knows, <laughs> for sure. Um, anybody, any other questions? We got a lot of candy. Yeah, we <laughs> do. I mean, you want, you want, let's, okay. <laughs> okay, well, our next session will be Advanced HTML5. So everyone who stand for that. Just, <laughs> you want a snicker? Thank you. All right. Thank you.